So this is the first type of application of, of nuclear fission, and that is to build an atomic bomb. The term atomic bomb is a little misleading because it has because what's going on has nothing to do with the uh, with the electrons outside the nucleus. It's the uh, it's it's the uh, uh, atomic nucleus itself that's 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 undergoing fission. So a better term is called nuclear weapons. Okay, but when it comes to nuclear weapons, there are two types: fission type and, and fusion type. The fusion type is called hydrogen bomb. So it's it's a more generic term. Uh, what we're dealing with is a fission-based nuclear weapon. That's the first type before the hydrogen bomb was built, which, which was even more powerful. Now, let's see here. The yield or the energy released in a nuclear weapon is typically uh, is typically measured in the in the equivalent tons or kilotons of TNT. Again, we're talking about million times typical chemical reaction. One kiloton of TNT. TNT is a high explosive, conventional explosive. One kiloton of TNT explosion will yield about a trillion calories of energy, about four times ten to the twelve joules of energy. That's a good number to to know. Very easy to know. About one trillion calories. Okay. Um, so if even one kiloton of TNT, that's quite a lot. But a nuclear nuclear bomb typically has a lot more than that. Let's see. Historically, only two atomic bombs were actually used in real combat, and those are the ones dropped over uh, Hiroshima and Nagasaki in the year 1945 towards the end of the Second World War. The first one was dropped on Hiroshima. The second one, three days later, dropped on Nagasaki. The first one is called the Little Boy. The second one is called the Fat Man. Uh, the first one has a yield of 12 to 15 kilotons of TNT, not one kiloton, 12 to 15 kilotons of TNT. And the second one, the fat man, is a little bit stronger. It's got 20 to 20 type, uh, kilotons of TNT. From a technical point of view, both were of different designs. The first one, the little boy, is called gun-type uranium device. The second one is called plutonium implosion device. We're going to talk briefly about the different technical difference between these two, and uh, a lot of people died um, in the uh, in in these uh, in the aftermath of these atomic uh, explosion, and uh, the uh, roles these bombs played at the end of the Second World World War is still being debated. Some believe it actually prevented more deaths because Japan then surrendered shortly after that, uh, so uh, we didn't have to uh, uh, kill even more people and soldiers through an invasion of Japan. Uh, but there are different uh, takes on, 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 this, uh, on this historic event. What we're talking about is not the politics. We're talking about the uh, physics, the uh, technical aspect. Okay, These are the first two bombs, and the only two bombs being used in real war. Later on, after the war, uh, both the United States and, and former Soviet Union tested a lot of bombs, nuclear weapons after that. And the largest fission bomb ever tested was by the United States. It's called Ivy King. It, has, it had a yield of 500 kilotons of TNT. You compare that with the Hiroshima bomb or Nagasaki bomb, L look at the difference. We're talking about a difference of 20 to 30 times. 500 kilotons. Okay, it is half a megaton of TNT. And it's got a 60 kilogram uranium core, and it's of the implosion type, not the uranium gun type. We'll talk about the differences. Um, today, there are several declared nuclear nations in the world, and a few um, who uh, smaller nations who also have nuclear weapons. All the five permanent members of the United Nations Security Council are declared nuclear nations, plus uh, uh, a few other countries, India, Pakistan, uh, Israel probably, and, uh, and uh, North Korea. And today, of course, Iran is also uh, in the news about for, for possibly building a nuclear bomb. Um, the uh, materials, the fission materials in a nuclear bomb typically is are one of these two. Uranium-235 or plutonium-239. There are some lesser-known materials we can also use. 
233 uranium. This is actually more efficient than 235, except extremely rare, so it will not be easy to, to, to gather enough materials to build something like this. Uh, and then, then s there's a couple other things, but primarily we're going to focus on these two materials. Okay, uranium-235 is a natural radioactive material. It's got a half-life of 700 million years. 700 million years. And it, it is the only primordial nuclide used as a fissile. Let me explain to you. What's a fissile? A fissile is a, mater is a material we use in a fission bomb or fission nuclear power plant. Okay? It's called a fissile. It is able to sustain chain reaction by itself. What's a primordial nuclide? You know what a nuclide is, right? It's a, it's a specific combination of the number of protons, the number of neutrons. So uh, that's called a nuclide. There are n hundreds of different nuclides, and of these nuclides, 288 are primordial nuclides. These nuclides have existed. Th they were in existence before the Earth was formed. Before the Earth was formed. So they are they, they're very, very ancient. And out of these 288, the only one being used as a fissile today is the uranium-235. And this number 225, 255 represents all the known um, nuclides that are stable. Stable, they do not decay in any form. And uh, so out of that 288 primordial nuclides, 255 are stable and they still exist today. Okay, so you know, the UN-235 is actually quite uh, unique in, in this respect. Okay. And again, here is a typical app, uh, typical uh, fission event. It captures a neutron and then splits into two parts plus neutrons plus energy. Like I said, there are different ways for it to split, you know, into Y and Z. Right? I, so I wrote two examples here. Okay, here it, it goes to into barium, krypton. That's it's split these two ways. You can also split like this, and you know the number of neutrons emitted are different, and there are different ways in addition to these two. Okay, this guy emits 100 m. 80 MeV, this guy emit a little bit more. So you see, they're all different, but on average, you, you're talking about 200 MeV of, of energy released per fission event. And the number of neutrons, again, varies from uh, reaction to reaction, but typically, uh, the, on average, you're looking at two and a half neutrons emitted. That's, that's the K value, not K factor. Okay, in a, nu in a fission atomic bomb, what happens after the detonation? What is the energy conversion process? Well, the detonation, after the detonation, the, uh, the, uh, ex uh, the nuclear fission typically takes place about, uh, about half a microsecond okay, after the detonation. We're talking about extremely short time interval. After half a microsecond, fission starts. And uh, so everything just starts to explode, and it's a very quick process. The energy release, 7% of the energy release is gamma ray radiation. But 93% of the energy release becomes the kinetic energies of the of the of the particles uh, involved, heavy particles involved, and they can travel at a speed of 12,000 kilometers per second, per second, not per hour. Okay, and these particles, um, they will, they are temporarily still trapped in the in 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 this in in this uh, uh, in the bomb because of the uh, shield and and which we call temper all these materials. And within a very short period of time, they, they do not move very far. They're still trapped. But they will bombard, they will, they will collide with the particles in the in a temper, which is typically made of uranium-238. So in doing so, they will give off x-rays. OK, x-rays. We're talking about time scale of a millisecond after the detonation, x-rays. These x-rays are the primary source of energy, which will later turn into heat. That's uh, that's the damage, uh, you know. That's the uh, that's the kind of explosion that you will see. It's, it's driven by the heat produced by these X-rays, and as a result, the the uh, core of the of the bomb, the temperature rise, rises to such a high value it becomes plasma. At the temperature of one, about 10 million Kelvin, 10 million Kelvin. So that's that's what happens. This all happens in about a millisecond. Within a millisecond. After that. Uh, uh, even though the uh, the uh, explosion has stopped, the uh, radiation still exists because all these Ys and Zs, all these guys, they're radioactive. 
and some of them are long-lived radioactive elements. So they will stay radioactive for a long time. You know, we're talking about decades or even longer. So that is a very bad aspect of the atomic bomb, and that is the explosion itself is only the beginning of the problem. You have to deal with long-term nuclear radioactive fallout, primarily through beta decay, because these guys have too many neutrons. So they want to turn their neutrons into protons and through beta decay. That's that's how they do. That's the typical formula for that to happen. Okay, so that's uh, what's going on after the explosion starts. Now, I said uranium-235 uranium is a primary fissile material for atomic bombs. In fact, it's also true for nuclear power plants. But you know, uranium-235 is not an abundant form of the isotope of uranium. There are a few different isotopes of uranium, 235, 238, 233, and so on. But 238 is the predominant isotope of uranium in terms of abundance. The uh, 238 is the most predominant. 99.3 of the natural uranium found on Earth is 238. 235 is only about 0.7% in abundance. So how come we do not use 238? We have to use 235. What's the reason? Well, you look at the half-life of 238. The half-life is 4.5 billion years. That's about the age of the Earth, okay, which is much, much longer than the 700 million years of 235. And what that tells us is that, remember, we're talking about pre, uh, primordial elements, okay, primordial nuclei. Those things have existed even before the Earth was formed. And then in, in the four or five billion years since, uh, since the birth of the Earth to today, most of the 235 have already decayed through through uh, alpha decay and a series of alpha decays and beta decays and so on, right? So most of them are gone. You cannot find them anymore. This guy, on the other hand, with such a long half-life, we still have relatively a lot more of them left. That is why this guy, 238, is the predominant form of isotope in uranium in nature. However, good news or bad news, depending on who I'm talking to, 238 is not a fissile, even though it's fissionable, but it's not a fissile. What is the difference? A fissionable material means if you give it a neutron under the right circumstance, it will split. It will, first of all, it will form an unstable 239, and it will split and will produce several neutrons. So it is fissionable under the right circumstances, but it's not a fissile. A fissile is a material that can self-sustain a chain reaction, a fission chain reaction. The problem with 238 is that this neutron coming in must have a lot of kinetic energy. It must be a fast neutron. It must be fast neutron. Slow neutrons will not do the job because with a, with a fast neutron, you will have enough kinetic energy, which when combined with 238, produces a 239, which is energetic enough to split into two. If this guy comes in uh, with a very little kinetic energy, then it can form 239, but that 239 does not have enough energy to split apart anymore. Okay, Unlike 236, which came from 235, 236 is energetic enough to split into two by itself. So therefore, unless the incoming neutron is very fast, the 238, after absorbing the neutron, does not, it can go to here, but it doesn't split anymore. Okay. Now, the problem with fast neutrons, fast neutrons are not easy to be captured because they move so fast, they can easily just collide with you elastically or they just uh, scrape, uh, they just, uh, uh, they just uh, fly by that before you have a chance to capture it, it's already gone. So it's not very effective uh, to be captured. And therefore, only slower neutrons are more useful to sustain chain reaction. And as a result, 238 does not sustain a chain reaction by itself. It is not, therefore, a fissile. This is bad news for the nuclear industry because 238 is far more abundant in nature. We have to we have to convert it to we have to take the natural uranium, which is mostly 238, and enrich it, which means we have to convert it to mostly 235, which is a fissile. But it's also good news for nu nuclear safety because if 238 is directly usable as as a fissile, especially as atomic bomb material 
then because of its relative abundance, um, a lot of people can get, get their hands on it, and then this world will become far less secure. Right? Okay, so the enrichment process is the process which takes, which extracts 235 out of mostly 238 in natural uranium. You see, the abundance in nature for uranium is 235 is 0.7%, right? Which is useless as a bomb. For a bomb, you need 90%, 235 or more. Even as, a, even as uh, fuel rods for a power plant, you need about 2 to 5% instead of 0.7%. And this enrichment process is difficult and expensive because there is no chemical difference between 238 and 235. They have exactly the same chemical property. The only way to separate them is through physical means. You notice they have slightly different masses. That's the only difference between them, uh, you know, if you want to separate them. And you take advantage of that, you put, first of all, you turn uh, the, the uranium in, in, into a gas form, and then you spin it in a centrifuge centrifuge. If you spin in a centrifuge, this guy being a little bit more massive will, will tend to move more outwards. This guy, less massive, will have a higher concentration near the center of the centrifuge. So you spin it at a very, very high rate, uh, then towards the, uh, uh, you know, near the uh, center of the centrifuge, the, the uh, concentration will, 235 will go up, and, uh, and then you take near, you know, take that portion and you go on to the next stage and go to the next stage and so on. After multiple stages, a lot of hard work in a large facility, you will be able to get enriched uranium-235. And if you get a certain amount of quantity and certain amount of concentration, 90% above, you get yourself the raw material for an atomic bomb. This is the most difficult part in building an atomic bomb. And thankfully, it's a difficult step. And therefore, uh, you know, um, at least the terrorist groups do not have the, uh, the means of doing that yet. Otherwise, we're all in huge trouble. So now suppose you have enough fissile material with, 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 uh, with enough enrichment. Now what? How do you detonate an atomic bomb? Well, again, the key here is to achieve super crit criticality, which means k effective is greater than 1. That's called super crit criticality. And the key idea here is the so-called critical mass. Here's the thing. Suppose I have a, a, a sphere of uranium, 235. It's got a radius r, surface area a, volume b. You know, the surface area a goes like r squared. The, the volume goes like r to the power 3. And therefore, when you double r, you find the area grows by a factor of 4, but the volume grows by a factor of 8. So the volume grows faster than the area grows. Why is that an important observation? Because you have to look at what triggers this, uh, this fission. You start with one neutron somewhere. There are neutrons, straight neutrons everywhere. So this neutron hits uh, a, a target, and, and then, then, then you split into two or three neutrons afterwards. Now, if these neutrons all go on to the next stage, you're going to have a runaway chain reaction, and boom, the thing just goes off, OK? It's not like you light a match and just watch it explode. No, lighting a match, that's a chemical process. There is no chemical process going on here. It's a, it's a nuclear process, OK? So the way you detonate it is to achieve super crit criticality. But the thing is, some of these neutrons we may decide to escape. Okay, they may decide to escape. Um, if they do not escape, then they have a chance to, 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 to collide with the next stage. So here, a couple of things. First of all, you want enrichment. You want a lot of 235 here, a lot of 235 here, so that this neutron, before it has a chance to escape, will, 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 will meet another 235 and start another stage in, it, in the chain reaction. So you need enrichment. That's one thing. And for certain percentage of enrichment, let's say 90% or 85% or whatever, it have, must have also big enough size. Because as the size grows, the volume grows like out of the power 3, faster than A, which grows like out of the power 2. The escape probability depends on how big the surface area is, right? Because you have to go through the surface when you escape. The greater the surface, the more chance you, you can escape. But the chance of you meeting another 235 to start another fission event depends on the volume, the total number of neutrons, I mean, total number of uranium-235, which in turn depends on the size. So as the size grows, the number of uranium-235 grows faster than the area of the surface grows. So you have, relatively speaking, more chance of fission 
and less chance of escaping. All right. So here's the idea. You, you, you take this uh, uranium sphere, you give it a certain amount of enrichment, and uh, then you can calculate how big should that sphere be so that I can reach supercriticality. As long as the sphere has size greater than the critical size so that the mass of this uranium ball exceeds the critical mass, it will just go off by itself. You do not have to light a match, which is useless. It just goes off by itself in a matter of split seconds. So this is the idea of triggering the nuclear reaction. What is the critical mass of uranium-235? Well, it depends on the enrichment. If you're looking at 80%, 85% enrichment, then you need a ball of about 17 inches in uh, 17 centimeter in diameter, which is not big, which is about, it's, it's only about this big. And it's going to go off by itself, okay, if, 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 if you ever did that. So do not hold something like that in your hand. And uh, that has a mass of 56 kilograms. 56 kilograms. Now, that is when you just have a bare uh, sphere of, of your 235. You don't do anything else. In reality, we can reduce the size of critical mass, which is what's needed for, for ignition, by using some other technical enhancements, such as temper, neutral reflector, and so on. We're going to talk about those things a little bit uh, later. So with these technical advancements, you can, you can achieve nuclear ignition in the, even in a smaller sphere. You don't have to have 56 kilograms of enriched uranium to start a bomb. Okay, so you have a sphere like this. Make sure it doesn't, doesn't uh, become big enough. Otherwise, it's going to explode by itself. So this gives us an idea. How do we, how do we ignite a nuclear bomb? The way we do that is we have, say, two pieces, each with mass lower than the critical mass. Okay, And then normally they are separated one here, one there, and they do not, of course, uh, they do not uh, produce any, any, um, any explosion. But when we're ready to detonate it, what, what, what do we do? We bring these two pieces together, the total mass exceeds the critical mass, and then all of a sudden it explodes by itself because the runaway chain reaction taking place in a matter of uh, microseconds. So again, that's the idea. One piece of subcritical mass, another piece of subcritical mass, we bring them together upon detonation, and then you achieve supercriticality that way. And there are two ways to bring these two pieces together. One is called gun type, the other is called implosion type. The United States pioneered both types of, of bombs. In fact, uh, the, the two bombs dropped in Japan. One of them was gun type, the other one is implosion. And uh, roughly speaking, this is how these two types work, the triggering mechanism. Here you have the gun type atomic bomb. And an, an example was the little boy, the one that dropped on, uh, on Hiroshima. The little boy had two uranium pieces that were separated before. This is like a uranium bullet. It has a mass of 39 kilograms, about 90% enriched uranium. And here is a hollow core, otherwise known as a target. It's got a uranium mass of 26 kilograms. Both are subcritical, so no explosion. Upon detonation, you use a conventional charge, conventional explosive. Okay, basically that's just a, just a, just a regular bomb. It goes off and it propels this bullet towards the target. The two pieces come into one, and the total mass of both of them exceeds the critical mass and the bomb went off. That's how. That's that's what's going on. Okay, it is a. Uh, so the little boy was an example of gun type. This type of uh, requires highly enriched uranium, at least eighty percent of two thirty five, and that's very expensive. But the advantage is that this this type of uh, 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 trigger is relatively simple to make. It does not require very high technology. You can just, uh, you know, just basically fire this into there, and that's it. Um, that's called a little boy. Now, in the original 
Manhattan Project, there were there were several different groups. One worked on the little boy, this this gun trigger mechanism. Another worked on what's called the Thin Man. Thin Man never turned into reality. Thin Man was a project in which they used plutonium instead of uranium. And the, uh, the thing about plutonium is that it is even more effective as a fissile. You do not need that many kilograms. But what people found later was that when they tried to purify plutonium, they, they got not only 239 plutonium, they also got 240 plutonium, which itself released neutrons in enough quantity through its own, uh, its, through its own decay that these neutrons can in, uh, in potentially trigger uh, an inadvertent nuclear explosion. So they decide not to, not to do that anymore. You know, you cannot put in such large quantity. OK, so this type of bomb is not as safe as the other type, which we'll talk about in a minute. It is prone to what's called pre-detonation or fizzle, if you're not careful about it. And the reason why is that we're looking at relative large quantities of enriched uranium. Okay, If you somehow have some, some, some neutrons, straight neutrons coming in, and especially if they're slow, if they're slow-moving neutrons, they have more chance to be captured by the 235, and that can cause chain reaction more easily. And so there is a chance, if you do not design it carefully enough, it's going to it's going to go into a stage of pre-detonation or fizzle. So you have basically a, a partial detonation of, what, of, of the bomb, and that will release enough energy to blow the whole thing apart. So even though it's not an entire piece that, that, that goes off, the bomb will be destroyed. OK, and uh, this is particularly a problem if, uh, if this weapon somehow accidentally got dropped into the ocean from, from the airplane. So it, 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 it's, it's broken, and then the ocean water will come in. The ocean water H2O will slow down the neutrons to make them more efficient, and that's going to cause, probably, will cause a pre-detonation. So it's not as safe to operate. The United States built this type of bombs in early stages, uh, after, you know, not only the Little Boy, but after the Second World War, they also uh, designed uh, this type of atomic bomb in the form of nuclear artillery shells, they could be fired from, uh, from a cannon because of the shape, you know, the sh shape, shape is like that. You, get, you, you need a gun barrel. So these bombs are typically shaped like a, like a, like a in, in a long cylindrical form. And curiously enough, South Africa also built five such bombs. South Africa has the world's largest uranium reserve. So they had access to more uranium than anybody else. This type of bomb uses a lot of uranium. It's not as efficient as the second type, which we'll talk about in a minute, but they're easier to design, easier to build. So maybe that's the, why, the reason why they built five such bombs. Ma very few other countries uh, ever have those bombs like that because they use a lot of uranium. But so, so South Africa built five of them, but uh, they admitted doing that, and uh, they have since dismantled it. But I put some question mark here because some other countries may still have may have this type of weapons, including, for example, North Korea, which we'll talk uh, in a little bit. Now, the second type of fission nuclear bomb is uh, the implosion type. The first one ever used in real combat was the Fat Man. That's the bomb dropped on uh, Nagasaki. That bomb had only a little over six kilograms of warhead of, of, of fissile, which is a lot less, which is about less than 10% of the, of the mass of the uranium-235 used in Little Boy. And yet, it had a greater yield, greater yield. It's uh, over 20,000 20, uh, kilotons of TNT instead of 13 or to 16. It's because it's got, a, it's got an efficiency of 20% fission. So 20% of the uh, prut plutonium-239 239 actually went on for fission, compared with about 1% of uranium 235 used actually undergoing fission to produce energy in the little boy. And we, you can use either 235 or plutonium 239 to build a bomb like that. That kind of bomb is more difficult to, to build, more difficult to design. The trigger mechanism is far more complicated, but it is more efficient and it's safer. Basically, the idea is this. You have a, this is called a pit, okay? This is called a pit. The pit con con 
uh, consists of two parts. One is the fissile core, in this case, uh, uh, the uh, plutonium or uranium. So that's the fissile core. And then this area is called a temper. The temper is typically made of, of depleted uranium or uranium-238, which is not a fissile material, but it's heavy. And then outside, you have, a, you have carefully placed layers of explosives, fast explosive, slow explosive, arranged like that. Um, and in the middle, there is, a, there is a region called neutron initiator. Okay, the design has to be extremely careful because everything, again, everything happens in a matter of, 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 of microseconds and all these spherical shapes has to be machined to, to extraordinary precision, talking about micrometers or less. It's because you want, upon detonation, you just detonate these conventional high explosives to, to create a perfectly spherical shock wave. Okay, so the shocker will push the temper in and then as the temper is pushed in, it compresses the uranium core. The force of, 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 of this push is, again, by spherical wave, and it's extremely strong. So that compresses the core, producing supercriticality. And as if that were not enough, in order to make sure that you have supercriticality at the right moment, you also have what's called a neutron initiator at the center. The neutron initiator is, is, is designed like this. You have two types of radioactive elements. Okay, one is polonium-210, two, and the, o the other is, uh, is, is beryllium-9. Uh, beryllium so here's what's going on. They are usually separated by a gold foil. Okay, polonium naturally produces alpha particle, but it's blocked by this gold foil from reaching beryllium on the other side. Now, upon detonation, this we're talking about enormous compression, so the gold foil is just gone, right? When the gold foil is gone, these alpha particles produced by the polonium will now be able to reach beryllium, and this beryllium will then capture the alpha particle and to produce neutrons. So you have all of a sudden a burst of neutrons coming out from here. These neutrons will participate in the fission process to facilitate the fission process. So this neutron initiator basically produces um, extra dosage of neutrons to uh, to make sure this, uh, this uh, detonation goes off. Again, this is a far more complicated design, uh, not, uh, probably not available to uh, countries with lower technology for, for, for nuclear weapons, but they are more efficient. You have more fissile to uh, uh, undergoing fission. And what the temper does is, first of all, it pushes, okay? It, it's a temper and pushes, it pushes it in, and secondly, it also acts as a neutron reflector. The neutrons that try to escape after, after the fission, some of them are turned away because they collide with uranium-238, and they turn away, they come back, and start it again. So that's basically the design of implosion type. Um, we can do a little calculation of the yield or energy production in the nuclear bomb. If you take a 56 kilogram uranium sphe uh, 235 sphere with 85% enrichment, this is the critical mass. Okay, this is the critical mass. It will just go off by itself. You don't have to do anything, just go off by itself. Anybody stupid enough to do something like that, it's going to explode in your face. But uh, what kind of uh, energy production would, would that be? 56 kilograms about one-tenth of a percent of that uranium-235 actually uh, turns their energy, it turns their mass into energy, right? Because I said, you know, uh, about one MeV per nucleon, that's one-tenth of a percent of their best energy. Okay, so that's 10 to negative 3 times 85% enrichment. The other 15% is not fissile at all. Times C squared, you take the mass and turn it into C squared. That is the energy released. You have to convert that energy from joule to kilotons of TNT equivalent. Again, every kiloton of TNT is equivalent to one trillion calories or about four trillion joules. So, so that's that. So assuming that all this material undergoes fission, okay, every single nucle nucleus goes into fission to produce energy, you're going to get uh, 10 to the 3 kilotons of TNT. 
That's a thousand kilotons. It's a, it's a, it's one million tons of TNT. Okay, one million tons of TNT. Now this is too good to be true. The efficiency is a hundred percent. In a reality, let's take a, a look at what happened in reality. Little boy, that's the gun type, not very efficient. It has a combined fissile mass of about sixty-five kilograms. Ten to the negative three. That's that's how we convert into into energy. This this percent comes from energy. It's about ninety percent enriched times c squared divided by the same factor times the efficiency, and that is the percent of of fissile is actually undergoing fission equals the actual yield, which is about sixteen kilotons of TNT, and E is about one percent. You know what that means? Only one percent of the uh, unit two thirty five that took years to to and careful work and a lot of money to enrich actually went into fission. The not the remaining ninety percent simply gets scattered. Okay. Now it's interesting, it's curious for us to investigate from a technical point of view what happened to the two nuclear detonation by North Korea. North Korea detonated one nuclear device in the year two thousand six and yet another one in two thousand nine. The first one had a yield about 0.5 to 0.8 kilotons of TNT. And the next one is a little bit more, was a little bit more about uh, several kilotons of TNT, depending on who, uh, who, who you believe, several tons, several kilotons, I should say. Now, both of these are considerably less than the yield of the little boy, which is 16 kilotons of TNT. We're talking about uh, one-tenth to one-twentieth of the yield of a typical first nuclear bomb test. So they had some, a couple of very small detonations. So you wonder what happens, okay? And from a technical point of view, two things could have happened that can explain such a small yield. One is they had only a partial detonation, which means most of the fission materials never went, never went into fission. They just got scattered, okay? Another thing is that they were somehow able to miniaturize a nuclear bomb they were able to achieve super criticality with a very small amount of fissile. And you know that is difficult. We're not talking about chemical reaction, just ignite it just ignite it with a match and, and no matter how much you know you have, uh, it just gonna explode, right? Here, we're talking about you know, you have to amass a certain amount of fissile together to to reach super criticality. And if you want to reduce that from this fifty six kilogram mass, you have to use things like like temper, like neutron reflector, like neutron initiator, all these things that can help you reduce the amount of fissile material you, you, you need. So you can produce a smaller yield nuclear bomb. This is difficult technology. So one of these two possibilities, okay, A, a very advanced mi 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 miniaturized warhead, and secondly, um, just a, a pa only partially successful detonation a crude device. So who do you believe? Well, uh, let's, uh, let's hope that uh, they have not mastered the technology of a mi miniaturized warhead, otherwise the situation would be even worse.